not take on cases that are from 1975. In 1975, Dorothy Garoshko went missing. She was at the penalty box. Like, if we solve this, this will be the oldest case that we've ever solved. And one that has haunted Boston for years. For 48 years, she's been missing. It's time for her to come home. who have all but given up on finding their loved ones, this team is a last hope. Civilian divers cracking cold cases for free. Today we are stepping into Boston, Massachusetts, where I'm meeting up with a good friend of mine, Bill McIntosh again, who has been on some previous episodes with us. A little bit of quick backstory before we get into Dorothy here. We really haven't done a full backstory with you on our previous episode, so I want to cover that. <laughs> now listen, I'm going to go ahead and toot him. We train Navy SEALs. Candidates, yep. For, Can for. Navy SEAL candidates. Uh, you have also have a hockey league as well. Yeah, I own uh, the Rhode Island Saints Hockey Association, which is uh, 10 teams of, of minor league hockey for kids. Um, and I've been training kids for the military for the last 11 years, uh, specifically guys that are for EOD, SWIC, and the Navy SEALs. But more importantly, Bill has been out with us on Donnie Mezier. He's also been down in Australia with Down Under Dan. Amazing experience going down there to help Dan you know, bring Dale Nicholson home and uh, hoping that, da that, that Dan's actually able to bring more people home. Yep. Bill and I ended up meeting up is that Bill is actually not just Dale and not just Donnie here, but he's been out there on his own previous to AWP solving his own cases. And so to date, you now have seven or eight now that you've solved. Yeah, seven cases of, of land searches. And then the two with, with you, with, with Donald Messier and Dale Nicholson with, with uh, with with Dan Down Under and then and of course Leveda and Robert Proctor we worked on that case where the public was able to bring them home just outside of our search aspects so you know we, we, it's been it's been an amazing experience again like just just to be a part of this and be a part of the movement to make a difference with these families and and to to see such progress in, in the organization where it's it's spreading worldwide. And I appreciate you being a part of this with us and being here today. And you know, and today we are in Bill's backyard. Bill's just lives down the road from here, just up here in Massachusetts where we're at right now. And this case, like you're you're really driving me for this case. Normally I will not take on cases that are from 1975. 79 or 75? 75, 1975. Okay, so, so bring us into the entire story. In 1975, uh, Dorothy Garoshko went missing. Supposedly it, it could have been a murder at the time, but she was at the penalty box, which is right there at, behind TD Garden. Okay, and the penalty box was an old bar that everybody used to, to uh, frequent. And in, during that time, you know, Boston Bruins were playing all the time and everyone would party there until two o'clock in the morning and then they go to after hours parties. She lived in Brighton on Monastery Road, which is about nine miles from here. And so she would take this road, she would park here, she'd go to the bar, she'd go to the bar and then she'd work her way up to home, up to Brighton, up, up Sturrow Drive, right along the Charles River. So we're in the Charles River right now um, right here, and this is where the duck boats are, this is where Harvard crew and Northeastern and BU crew uh, do all their training in, in the Charles River. You know, I have a feeling that either she was, she went in here or on one of the S-turns near Longfellow Bridge, and so we want to double check everything that's in here because it, it's never been really clearly checked by anyone that had top of line sonar. You have to come into the topography, you know, and what the area looked like from the, uh, from the past. So our system only goes back to like 85 sometimes, but 92 is kind of where it's at. And so we'll throw up what this area looked like back then, but you had old sand, you know, sand and uh, gravel back then. In fact, you still have sand and gravel right across the way that's working over here. This whole section was sand and gravel. And so then what comes into my mind is we've found individuals off sand and gravel areas before. And so then you look at the, I don't want to say that this is foul play because we stay away from foul play, but we're looking at the, all those accident, you know, she's, you know, she's drunk late at night, um, could come over for a late night, you know, love fest or whatever, accidentally put it in, in drive instead of reverse, and you could absolutely end up 
off into the water. So we want to check all these locations. And you can see that that angle of those stones over there, very easy to put the car in. And back in the day, that grass area was not there. So, I mean, back in 75, I talked to my dad about it. This whole section was clean. Like there was nothing there. You could have gone right in. Right. So the, what we're looking for is a 1970 Ford Maverick. It's, it's a yellow Ford Maverick with, with a black top. Uh, its license plate is 9K7755. Dorothy had three children at home, and so one of the children, Rick, has reached out to us and asked us to, to see if we could find uh, her, his mother. And so, you know, I thought that it would be, a, you know, again, something to bring some closure to a family, you know, here in our hometown or my hometown uh, to see if we can make a difference in the community to also end this 48 years he, she's been missing. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, a few things would come into this, not just a case that's really old like this, but any case. We have a female individual that's out at 2 a.m. Nothing good ever happens at 2 a.m., so remember that. Um, you have intoxication going on. You have a, we have the potential foul play in this one, but again, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking, if she's here, this is not foul play in my opinion. This is an accident. Because then we also come to the Mavericks. Well, the Mavericks, a whole lemon law, brake issues. I mean, kind of take us down that rabbit hole of the Mavericks and uh, why so, they've taken those out of, out of commission. So what we found out is that the 1970 to 1975 Mavericks that were that existed were having serious brake issues. They were a heavy, heavy vehicle, and the brakes weren't able to deal with them. And there was a lemon law that actually took them off the road at that point. We have multiple cars in the U.S., multiple Mavericks that we're looking for, cases that you've already looked at Leslie Guthrie and her two kids Timothy that's and uh, a, Julie that's in a Maverick as well so there are I think there's four total Mavericks in the country that are missing with a person so it tells me that there's some possibility that she could have gone off the road it's a it's a heavy vehicle with no power steering at two in the morning at two in the morning intoxicated intoxicated with brake issues with a vehicle that you know is a 1970 so it's five years old might not have been serviced well and and you know this is a case where it very clearly could have gone in somewhere here and and i think it's something that's solvable in that way i mean if for 48 years she's been missing you know, it's time for her to come home So in your opinion, we'll uh, do the far side first then, close to TD. Yep. And then we'll, how about if we take it from the uh, lock over here? So right over there where the truck is going and the uh, little Amtrak train, we'll hit it where that lock is at and then run that entire bank down to TD and down to the uh, harbor there. That way we'll clear that entire side of it. Check speed, contrast, frequency, water column. All right, here we go, a couple of logs in here. As we are cruising through here, like I said, we were talking about how this used to be all sand and gravel over here. So how long do you think this channel has been in here? Will we find any cars in this actual channel here? Was this always an island over here? I think some of the stones are older. Like is this part of pre-1975 over yes, here? Yes, definitely. Okay, so we could have a car in this channel. So this channel has always been here then? Yes. Very shallow. Yeah, only two and a half feet deep here. Oh, we got something good nice there. Right there. Yeah. See that? Right there on the left? I see it. I think it's too square, but it's it also... Looks like, it looks like one of these blocks. Yeah, it's, it's bigger than a block though, I think. So it's, and it's what we're looking at here on sonar that we just went over, we were pointing out on the left, on the bottom side of the screen, it was uh, what we call side scan. In fact, we just went off over it again right there. And so the side scan is, I can scroll back to it right here, and I can zoom in, and I can say, all right, well, it's too square in shape. We don't have any real height to it. And this is a picture in time. We're casting 75 feet to the left and 75 feet to the right. So it's not very tall, and so like Bill said, it appears to be more similar in shape to what these rocks are over here. But what we want to do is get right over the top of it with our live scope. It's the other sonar image that we use here. And when we do so, we'll be able to manipulate it, turn our sonar up and down, and kind of 
shine, more like a flashlight that we're shining on it to identify exactly what it is. And so that's kind of how we use the three sonar systems in conjunction with, with uh, one another here. The other thing I like to do when I am uh, doing sonar work is I like to start about 35 to 40 feet from shore for my side scan that I'm casting. And then if I feel like I need to go further out, if we're depending on the current, is it still water, is it still body of water, are we in a river, will then kind of change up the way that I'm going to do if I'm going to do a second pass or not. But more often than not, 35 feet to one side and a 75 to the other is gonna give me a nice 100 foot wide swath that I'm covering. There have been multiple cars found in the Charles River. Um, some have been accidents of the same day, but there are also vehicles that have not been found in here. And I, I think with this system, you, you should be able to locate anything on any major nook or cranny, like in a corner. Yeah, you, you know, and we're able to spot, like, you know, tires down here. So, I mean, if, we, if we're yep. able to spot a tire, we're going to be able to spot a car just fine. Jared, none of this was here. All of this was, was this is all new. This was all sand and gravel. This was all part of the, like, a, a, a rebirth in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. All of this, this building that's here. Okay. But all of this was here. This this bridge. Yeah, the Museum this... of Science. The bridge was here. Object there in the middle. Yeah, it's too small. Yep. So if you look at these pillars over here, we found an individual where a pylon had had actually been driven through his car. So even though they're out here, and we would. We don't want to make the assumption of, uh, oh, okay, the dock has been there. There's no way a car is going to be there. So we want to check that really good right up against all of them. Is that a boat? Oh, over on the left? Yeah. Right, right there? Yeah, it looks like a boat. 10 feet of water. Yeah, we got enough uh, depth here for sure. A lot, of, a lot of debris on the bottom. And remember, we're looking for a car that's been there for 48 years. Yeah, so it's just going to be mainly a frame at this point. Watch out. Got it. <laughs> and if you look at the sonar, you can see, we can see past each one of them. So you see the shadows. And what we don't see is we don't see a great big shadow blocking a whole bunch. Um, over here, it looks like we might have something. So that's going to be on the other side of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn and shoot back through that section right there. It might have been coming through this first row that we just came through. And then it might have been casting and hitting this big row right here. We can see through all of these now right here. And so that clears everything on that side and that side, except for right here. We still have one weird chunk right here we want to double check and check that out. I didn't see any height, but we'll double check it. There's a good amount of stuff right there. Yeah, but yeah, we just don't have anything that's high enough. What's the height of that? It's only two feet tall, as far as the debris field that's there. Yeah. This is the Boston Garden right there. So back in the day, this this was all accessible. Accessible to put a vehicle right in. So all this was open back all, in the day. All these fences weren't here. Okay, look, 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 right there. You have an old car right there. Right at the state police. Right at the state police. Right where the parking lot is at. That could be your car. Very clearly under this bridge. Yeah. Yeah, that is an old car. It's on side scan right here. Right there. That could be your car. That car is old enough to be 30, 40 years old. So because it's so old, it's not gonna stick like a uh, regular car. You're in front of it now. See that? So those are old uh, metal chunks that the car has fallen apart. It's so old. So that's where you're left with only a frame. 
Now you're still gonna have bones in there, so that's gonna be the big thing that you're gonna be able to identify, but those bones are gonna be buried in all this silt and sediment as well. So the chance that you have is being able to still be able to recover like a headlight or license plate, not a license plate, but a headlight or a tail light is kind of the way that you're gonna be able to identify this at this point in time. I think I could probably make a phone call over to the detective that's in charge of the case and see if we can gain access to the state police boat ramp uh, to, to dive and actually to bring it right in. It's only got cones in yeah. the parking lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if I, if I can pull over here and just get permission and we'll just throw a uh, buoy on it. Yeah, you know, instead of a buoy, I'll just run this over to the dock. So we don't need to scan that side. That's all new. We've already scanned all this. I would go there too. Huh? I would go there. All right. Shadow there. There's another car, maybe. Yeah. Yep. Let me double check that. Let me have you hold that. It's newer though. It's not. That's not old. I don't know, what is that? I mean, no, I mean, it's a car. I'm just saying what year, what model. I'm gonna hit a little bit slower here. Okay, look at the side of it right there. Yeah, there you go. Okay, that is not That's a That's not uh, the vehicle. That huh? looks like a grand, a Cadillac though, like. All right, so we don't, okay. need, we don't need to dive that on that That looks like one. a Cadillac. Yeah, I mean, 100% on that one, Bill. Boston, downtown, Cadillac. You know there's four or five people in the trunk of that one. It's probably possibly. I'm, I'm just gonna, it's very possible. I'm just going to say it right now. Uh, it's going to take us, whoa, it's going to take us 19 minutes to get from here to there. Oh, wait. It's gonna take us 10 minutes if you walk, or 19 minutes, and a toll of $1.25 to drive over there. This is ridiculous. Oh, it thinks that I'm, maybe it thinks I'm on the bridge there. Yeah, it's what it thinks. So if I go back across, okay. Okay. I, let's just get out there and then we'll figure it out. I have a semi plan. All right, let's do this. Like, if we solve this, this will be the oldest case that we've ever solved. 48 years old? 48 years old. And one that has haunted Boston for years. And if, if we find the F-150 after this down in Brockton, I mean, no one's ever looked for it. So then I have a do not enter, but I'm going in the do not enter. And I'm going straight down. And then state police is down here and they're gonna let us in. Yep. There he is there. Yep. He's watch out for that, for that beam on the left that's bent. Yeah. Um I didn't see what the temperature was today, but the moment you go under the surface and the longer you're in, the colder you get. So I have a set of thermals that go underneath my dry suit and Basically think about it like going out and going snowmobiling or going skiing. You have your outer layers, and so my dry suit is my outer layer, and then underneath is what keeps me warm. And so as long as my suit isn't doesn't have a hole in it, I'll stay nice and dry and warm. So anyway, I gotta find those thermals right now. Good. 
All right, now we're good to go. All right, the other thing we need to do, make sure we have enough air here. So this is a uh, my dive computer and it will read both tanks. So right now in my pony bottle, in my backup tank, I have 1700 PSI. And this is wireless, so I don't have any uh, cords regulating the air. Wait for it to connect. And it's not connecting. So my backup plan is to grab pressure gauge. All right, we got 1500 PSI, so we're good for a dive. How much did you fill up to? Uh, 3000. Okay, so that's like so. half. Yeah, and enough for me to put my dive in, do what I need to do to identify what this vehicle is. If I'm gonna be diving longer, then I'll put more air in it, but for now, for a quick dive or two, I can make it work in 17 feet of water. If I was going to be doing a lot more diving, then I would make sure that I was topped off. And we now have a dive compressor in here. So we can, we used to carry 18 tanks in here. We now carry eight tanks with us. And so the dive compressor right here will fill two tanks at the same time. It takes about 25 to 30 minutes to fill two tanks. Once we identify if this is our vehicle in question, it becomes a crime scene and now we turn it over to the local law enforcement. So while lo local law enforcement is here, it's not because we have the capability of diving on it and identifying it for them, they don't mind us doing so, but the moment we identify it as a crime scene or the vehicle we're looking for, then it becomes an actual investigation and they will take over at that point. Now, if some jurisdictions don't have a dive team or the assistance that for what we're able to offer, and so then we'll do everything from beginning to end, whereas Boston PD here, uh, that's actually one of the local divers on the state police team. And so they would end up taking over for the full investigation and do it right. And a vehicle like this, because it's so old, you cannot pull it out. It comes out in pieces. So they're gonna have to do, you know, dredging forensics and do everything they can to recover Dorothy if she's in the vehicle there. And that's what we're gonna to try to do also is identify if there are any remains in the vehicle. What's the knife for? So the knife is for safety. I put it on the inside of my leg here not on the outside. If I'm swimming and I get it caught somewhere or I, I get caught, I want to be able to reach it with either hand in order to grab it and cut myself out of something. So it has a set of uh, like scissors on there as well as a regular knife. And then it also has like a little hook knife on there as well. So really important to have. I also have another one on my dry suit or on my BC that I can reach as well because a lot of times you'll get into these, this isn't like mountain lake diving. Mountain lake diving, you'll end up with like, people are going after like the stockfish that are only like four, you know, four ounces, less than a pound. Whereas here they have the big test line, like 20, 30, 50 pound test line that you can get tangled up in and you can't break them. So you'll have to cut your way out. So you gotta be very careful about that stuff.
the right to the back. Let's see if we can get a tilt on it. We get a corner. We get a whole bumper. Alright, so it is upside down. Okay. So now we have identified it's cut way down. Now we need to figure out what's the front, what's the back. So it's 40 to 50 years old. I can't tell what it is. The picture that you have, is that the actual car? Yes. Take a look at the front bumper. On the front bumper, about this far apart, I have, it uh, kind of comes out. You know how like some have like the push bumper side uh, yep. out far apart? This is only about this far. But the trunk of it, we might be able to get the trunk, but it's coming apart quite a bit. It's open laying upside down. But if you have a front bumper picture of it? I do, I have a front bumper. It's, it's got a bend to it on the front left. It's, it's chrome. Now, I want to know, it's like, where, where a license plate would be. What? Let me see it. The license plate was over the gas. Uh, I want to see the fabric had over the gas cap back in the day. 1970 So front bumper, rather than being smooth all the way across, I'm looking for two protrusions. Yeah, it's two protrusions like that. Yeah, you're going to have to uh, pull I'll it get up it, on. Let uh, me get it there. Yeah, Google. But anyway, it's upside down. Um, only one wheel is left on it right now, so I, I could get the wheel. I can get the wheel. I got the wheel off. It was just too heavy for me to uh, drag, so I can take the. Uh, I can attach the line, and we can pull the wheel up. See if that'll help us. Uh, not custom wheels, but there is no hubcap left on it. Now, if I was doing a uh, really deep dive and I needed a full tank, then I would do that, but this is just equalizing from one tank to the other. So it's not going to give me an aluminum tank. Normally they're 3,000 PSI, whereas my high pressure stills are almost 3,500 PSI. So because this is almost empty and a full 3,000, we're probably going to bounce off right around 1,500 to 1,800. Do you see anything inside of it? No, it's upside down. And it's a uh, buried in silk over the years. So with it, think about the car being upside down. All of this is buried uh, up to the bumper here. So right now I don't have any access to the headlights or anything. So that's where it's at. So the engine is exposed and some of the uh, springs, but not the actual car itself. So I don't have any doors, door handles. I don't have any of that right now. I do have the trunk that is completely open right now. Turn the big main tank on, open it all the way, and then back a quarter turn. There you go. I just tied that whatever you want to do with that line. Okay. However you want to do it. Yeah, I'll see what I can do to kind of basket around it. And then, uh, yeah, after I do that, I'll give you like three tugs on the line so that way you guys can start working on that. Yep. And then I'm, I'm going to stay down there, work on that bumper, and see if I can dig down to any uh, lights or anything in front of it. Yep. Yeah.
Let me see if I can get some numbers of it. It was definitely not fiberglass. No fiberglass in a Maverick. What is that two though? I don't know. So I got a part number here. Yeah. Yes. Right hand. Right hand. Assembly 201-80184. You want to take a picture of that, it would be probably easier. So it, it goes like that. Alternate tire size, 165, 14 rims, 165 80s. This is a 215. So this is this is bigger than than a Maverick. That would be bigger than yeah, because it's 15 in width instead of 14 in width, yeah. and it's 165, so it's a lower profile. So the interior of this thing's green too. That's correct. That's for the trunk. That's the trunk, red with a green interior. Yeah, I think it's, I don't think it's the right color. Yeah, I don't think it's the right color. All right. And then the tires are 215 and uh, 15, and, and the Mavericks 14s. Okay. Well, I ended up with a small hole somewhere. I was holding on to the trunk as they were pulling it up because it was so flimsy, it was like folding in. So I was trying to bring it up over those rocks and help them out in the process. And as a result, somewhere, the metal ended up scraping the suit pretty good. So we're gonna have to find where that hole is and fill that in and fix that later on. Does that conclude diving for the day then? Huh? Does that kind of conclude diving for the day then? Oh no, I have another suit, but I think it has holes in it too. So, if we find what we're looking for, we'll push through it and we'll just be wet. It's not the best feeling, but we'll do it. look wet inside or are you just soaked? So, no, so the gloves seal here so it doesn't go beyond this seal here. The gloves um, are one of those things where they last for like the first five dives each if you're lucky when you're on these old rusty cars. Um, so really 
I use the gloves more as gloves rather than dry gloves, but the seal here keeps my suit dry. Okay. Except for we need to figure out where that hole is at so I can fix it later tonight and that way I got a dry suit again tomorrow. We're good to go. I knew that I should have just run over and gotten pizza, right? Keep going! But we, we decided to go into the north end with tiny little streets. Back them up all the way. Let's go, Jared! Go, go, go! Hold up, Jared! One more, go. Hold up! Come on! Thank you. Good call, very good call. <laughs> no, we're, we're totally screwed at this point. Unless I go back another block. It took us a little bit longer in rush hour traffic getting stuck in downtown Boston to make it up here to Jamaica Pond. But Bill, tell us the significance of Jamaica Pond. It's a little later in the day right now, so we're gonna come back to back to it tomorrow, but bring us up to why we want to concentrate on Jamaica Pond. So at the time of, that she went missing in 1975 in her 1970 Maverick, her boyfriend and her supposedly had a fight, according to family members and the police, because of a story that her boyfriend, Mr. Bolton, told the police. And they were at the Arboretum down the street, and the Arboretum is, a, is now a, an antique car museum, but at the time was just a gathering point for people. And at that location was, uh, they were supposed to have an argument that turned into an altercation where she was chasing him with the Maverick and actually trying to run him over with the car. And Jamaica Pond is the closest place. The son, Rick, believes that she's possibly here because it's a very close proximity to the Arboretum and it's in between the Arboretum and home. Uh, and so that's why we're here. It, it's been a, uh, one of the locations that has been uh, checked before by people, but because it's a non-motorized location at the same time, remember this is a 48-year-old cold case, they didn't have the technology and sonar that you're using on, on your boats. And the fact is, is that this needs to be cleared by someone that actually can, can read the sonars properly. And working with the uh, state police today also, you know, they're very much aware of our skills and our ability. They also know that we need to be in here and they did give us their card that says, you know, basically it's a get out of jail free card that says, you know what, we know that you need to get in there. We know that you have to have a motor. Please don't use the gas motor. Please make sure that you are using the electric motor to uh, keep everything nice and clean and pristine up here. So that's what we're going to be doing first thing tomorrow morning. We would have loved to do it tonight, but it's already way late in the day, so we are gonna to have to go grab some food right now, um, as well as it's still raining. Rain doesn't always stop us, but you know we do wanna make sure that we have enough time in our day to scan this properly, especially if we find something tomorrow. So if you have not done so already, make sure to subscribe. It is free and watch for part two that we're going to be releasing probably within the week right after this video. So thanks for being here and being a part of the search with us. Is it plausible that she came out here? The sun keeps telling us that there's a potential that he, she's in Jamaica Pond. Yeah, I'm gonna say we definitely have a car there and it's definitely old. We might, fingers crossed, find Dorothy in Jamaica Pond. Mm -hmm.